it's been said that there's a few words that are kind of hard to say. For some people, saying I love you is just the hardest three words in the world to say. But there are three other words that are very hard to say. Please forgive me. Or how about this? I was wrong. And some people have the worst time just admitting it. Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to begin at verse number 21. And we'll finish up at verse 35. So it's not all that long. 21 to 35, Matthew chapter 18. Folks at home, have your Bible open. Read along with us. All right, let's begin. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Please be seated. Boy, what a, what a story before us. But I have a little Christmas uh, angle on this. And it's entitled, Two Gifts for Christmas. A week this Friday is Christmas Eve, and the next day, of course, is Christmas. And so I'm trying to bring messages that will help us at this Christmas time and prepare our hearts for, for this. It's so very important that we not miss the blessing that God has for us. Don't be distracted. Don't be distracted. Folks at home, don't be distracted. Put away distractions. Let's concentrate on what God would have for us this evening. Now, um, most of us at some point will say things or do things that we regret. And then, you know, we wish, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish I had have done something else instead. There's always things that we're going to regret. There's a humorous story about a man who thought it was his lucky day. Apparently, this man opened up a business in New York City on 555 Fifth Avenue. And he walked into uh, the first day of his business. He, he walked in the first day and he realized, hey, today is the fifth day of the fifth month. The fifth day of May. He thought, boy, that's my lucky day. And so he thought, this is going to be great. And he walked up to his office, which was on the fifth floor. 
And so he, um, uh, he said, this is too good to be true. This is my lucky day. So he took $5,000 and he bet it on the fifth horse in the fifth race at Belmont Racetrack. And guess what happened? His horse came in fifth and he lost all his money. <laughs> so just a little sort of a humorous story, but I bet he wish he hadn't have done that. And there are times when we have to echo in, boy, I wish I hadn't have done that. Wish I hadn't have said what I said. Sometimes we act impulsively and we look back and say, that was a mistake. Have you ever done something or said something to someone that, boy, you wish you could go back and take back those words? It happens, doesn't it? Well, back in the days of John Wesley, uh, he was a great preacher in the 1700s. He came to America a couple of times, helped to win a lot of people to Jesus Christ. And he had the chance to meet General James Oglethorpe. General Oglethorpe lived in the 1700s. He was actually instrumental in forming the state of Georgia down in, in the USA. And as they got to talking, Wesley and Oglethorpe, the subject of forgiveness came up. And Oglethorpe said to John Wesley, he said, I never forgive and I never forget. To which John Wesley replied, Then, sir, I hope you never sin. And there's a lot of truth to that. What do you do when, uh, when you do something you shouldn't? Or, let's put it on this angle. What do you do when someone does to you something they shouldn't? How do we respond? What do we do? What action do we take when someone says something that's hurting and out of line and... Um, it's, uh, it's a lie. They say things to us or about us behind our back. Or they do things to us. What do we do? How do we deal with this? So that's what I'd like to look at this evening. And so would you bow your heads once more. Close your eyes and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, help us to understand what our Lord Jesus taught us in Matthew 18. And Father... We pray that you would grant to us a special blessing at this Christmas time. Help us to learn about these two Christmas gifts we want to talk about tonight. And help us to, uh, to take them and use them. And now, Lord, bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what do we do when someone hurts us? Well, we could say, well, you, you forgive them. But you know, that's easier said than done. And you know what I'm talking about. When you get hurt, when someone hurts you, and sometimes it's sad but true, but sometimes the people that can hurt you the most are the people that are closest to your heart. So the people in your life that are the closest, nearest, and dearest to you, they have the power to inflict the most injury. You know, if it's some you, someone you've never met before, you don't know them from a hole in the ground, they're a total stranger, and they say something absurd to you or about you, you just laugh them off as a lunatic. But if it's someone close to you, a friend, a family member, and they do it, all of a sudden it's a different story. And it can hurt. Well, what do we do? You know, we're, we're supposed to, uh, to, to forgive them, but um, boy, I tell you, it's uh, easier said than done. Um, I want to give you a couple of thoughts here before I get into the to the meat of the message, but um, here's a few suggestions for you. If it's, if it's happened to you or if it's happening to you and someone offends you and hurts you, here's what I suggest. Number one is you keep giving your pain over to Jesus. Keep giving your hurt over to Him day by day. Try not to hold a grudge. Number two, remember that most hurts are unintentional. People will say things and they don't realize that they cut you pretty deep. Maybe they were thinking it was a joke. Or maybe they, they thought they were trying to help you by telling you how ridiculous you look. And their motive was not to try and hurt you. 
but to help you. So remember that, that most hurts are unintentional. They didn't mean it. They didn't realize it. Number three, if it really was intentional, if they really did try and hurt you and damage you, then that person is sick and needs help. They need help. So pity them. Number four, uh, pray for that person. Pray for the one who hurts you. Number five, try to show Christ's love back to them. Overcome evil with good. And number six, if they ask for forgiveness, give it to them. Give it to them. But I want to talk with you now about two gifts for Christmas. And I think these things are timely. We sure don't want to finish off this year with a lot of um, bad feelings with anyone. We want to be able to resolve and close off accounts. And in just two weeks, two weeks this uh, Saturday, isn't it? Uh, it's a brand new year. I mean, it's the end of the year and we go into a brand new year. So we want to try and square things away and make sure that things are, are good. And, and anyhow, here's two gifts. Number one, the first gift is called uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness. This is the first gift. Now, that word forgive means to kind of hand it over. That's the idea. To give, to for, out front, give. When golfers hit the ball, what do they sometimes yell out? For! And all the other golfers for miles around stop, you know, in terror. And they look, where's that ball coming from? They don't want to hit in the head with a golf ball. That's got to hurt. And so the, the golfer... It's a, well, especially if it's going toward where some people are. Sometimes, those of you who play golf, you know what I'm talking about. The ball doesn't always go where you want it to. Sometimes it veers to the left or to the right, and there's some other golfers there. And so frantically, you scream out, four! And right away, everyone, you know, grips the turf. <laughs> Where's the bomb coming from? So to forgive means to, to give that in a forward motion there, to give it over, to give it up. Maybe that's another way to put it. Now, our Lord Jesus gave us an example of this on the cross. When cruel, wicked men nailed him there, he said, Father, what was the very next word out of his mouth? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. They didn't realize it. Those men did not realize that he was the creator. They did not realize that what they sowed, they're going to reap. I, I kind of think that if Jesus had not have prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If Jesus had not have prayed that prayer, the judgment of Almighty God would have fallen that day and barbecued all those wicked malefactors all around. They would have dropped dead. So I kind of think, I could be wrong, but I think that's why Jesus had to pray that. It was necessary. Now, sometimes we think, boy, if I was Jesus, I wouldn't have prayed that. I would just said, Father, let them have it. Yeah. There's the old fallen nature. When someone does something wrong to us and we want to see something bad happen to them, that's our human nature. That's unfortunately the way many of us are. I knew of a, a man, he's dead now, many years ago. He had a saying. His philosophy was... Um, um, you treat me right, I'll treat you right. You step on my toes, I'll jump on your head. That was his philosophy of life. A lot of people have that philosophy. You do me wrong and that's the last thing you'll ever do. And so the idea here of forgiveness is to give it over. Now, Christians are actually commanded to forgive the offenses of others toward them. I want you to see this. You're in the book of Matthew, chapter 18. Go back to chapter 5, would you please? This is the great Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5. And let's see. Let's look at verse 44. Chapter 5 of Matthew and verse 44. Follow along, I'll read it. Oh, let's go back to verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. 
And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Folks, if we were to take that one Bible verse and apply it to these days of COVID, we would solve a lot of problems. We really would. A lot of Christians wouldn't be all bitter and angry and upset with what's going on in the world if we would just apply that one verse of Scripture. But it goes on. Let's turn the page to chapter 6. And let's look at verse number 12. This is part of the prayer that the Lord taught us. Our Father which art in heaven in verse 9. Look at verse 12. And forgive us our debts. Watch this. As we forgive our debtors. That means people who owe something to us. And it's not just financial. It's when they say things and do things. And they, what they owe to us is to come and ask for forgiveness. They owe an apology, a proper apology. When our children were, were young, they were like any other children, and they would, you know, clash. And we would have to teach our children how to apologize. And of course, children, you know this if you've been a parent, or if you work with children, you know this is true. That when children clash, and when one is the malefactor, and, you know, does something to the other, and Shouldn't have done it. Say, that was wrong. You, you say you're sorry. And sometimes the kid won't even look at the victim. He'll just kind of put his head down and say, sorry. And that is not the way to apologize. Can you imagine if someone tried to get salvation with an attitude like that toward Jesus? Because all of our sins are against him and he died for us and suffered our hell on the cross. And we painstakingly teach a man or woman that they've sinned against Almighty God. They need to ask Jesus' forgiveness. And can you imagine if they prayed something like this? Sorry. Well, you'd know right away they're an idiot. You'd know right away that they're not going to get the gift of salvation because they don't mean it. And so when we're raising our children, we tried to teach them. Now you look them in the eye and you say, I'm sorry, and then we would fill in the blank for whatever it was. I took, I hit, you know, I spit, I bit you. I don't know what it was. I, I had totally forgotten what, what we'd fill in the blank there, but whatever the little mischief was, I'm sorry I did this to you. Would you forgive me? And they, boy, they didn't like doing this. But it's a good habit to learn. And that's an, more of an apology. When you look at someone or talk to them and you you say, I'm sorry I said those things about you. I was wrong. Would you please forgive me? Now, in the case of our kids, we asked them to go one further step because we could do this because it was family, you know, with the children. And we get one to say to the other, I love you. And, you know, that's a, they gag those words sometimes. You know, do I have to say it? <laughs> so those are funny things as we look back on, on them. But the principles are true. That a good apology means uh, a heartfelt confession of what you did that was wrong and asking forgiveness. And that's what people owe you when they hurt you and they say things, unkind things about you and they do things to you. And they are debtors. And look what Jesus says here. He says, forgive us, in verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors so to the degree i forgive others father you forgive me now the question is how do you want the father to forgive you fully completely or just partially do you want the father to forgive you with a, a happy heart or with a grudging spirit so the way you forgive your debtors that's the way god will forgive you isn't that interesting Let's look at verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Isn't that interesting? That's very interesting. That's good food for thought. Well, does that mean I'm going to lose my salvation? No, it doesn't mean that. But it sure is going to mess up your fellowship with the Father. It sure is going to affect things in your life. You can't afford. There are certain things in life you cannot afford to do. And one of them is to harbor grudges. 
for your own sake, and I'll get to this again in a moment, but for your own sake and sanity and blessing, you've got to get rid of it. When someone does some dirt to you, that's terrible. But for you to hang on to that dirt and rub it on your face and stick it in your ears and suck on it and go to bed with it, I mean, that's crazy. So we'll, we'll get to that, though. Um, let's see, let's uh, go to chapter 18 again, Matthew chapter 18, and we'll look at verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Peter must have thought that that was a, a good number. I mean, not just once or twice. Even Jesus said, you know, turn the other cheek. That was once, but here seven times, seven times. So then Jesus saith unto him in verse 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And what's the math on that one? Pastor Ivan, do you know? No, he's shaking his head. Anyone? What is it? 490, 490. Okay, to the best of your recollection, has anyone offended you more than 490 times? Is there any individual in life that has offended you more than 490 times? I can't think of one that's offended. I've, I can think of people that have offended me dozens of times, dozens and dozens of times. But I don't know of anyone who's offended me 490 times. But let me ask you this. Do you think there's anyone on earth that's offended Almighty God 490 times? Yes or no? Oh, big time yes on that one. Do you think it's possible that you've committed more than 490 sins in your life? Uh, definitely. Definitely. We see the long suffering of Almighty God. So when you hit your 491st sin against God, did he barbecue you? Okay, that's it. You've used up your 490. I get to push the button, the zap button. There's a button in heaven marked zap, Z-A-P. I think it has an exclamation mark on it too. And when God pushes that, then a lightning bolt comes down and barbecues you. No, God didn't do that. Aren't you glad? Our sins, our offenses against God number in the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands. So we're learning something here that we believers, we Christians, we are actually commanded to forgive the offenses of others toward us. It's a command. Now, when we become the cause of some ungodly offense toward another person, we now owe a debt to them, a debt of repentance, perhaps even restitution. And we will need to ask their forgiveness. And we ought to do it quickly and not wait. If you sin against God, you should ask forgiveness right away. If you sin against someone else, you should oh, stop. And repent and ask them to forgive you. Don't wait. It's been said that there's a few words that are kind of hard to say. For some people, saying I love you is just the hardest three words in the world to say. But there are three other words that are very hard to say. Please forgive me. Or how about this? I was wrong. And some people have the worst time just admitting it. Well, when we cause the offense, we'd better be ready to offer the repentance and ask the forgiveness. Well, why is it that we sometimes have such trouble forgiving people? Someone hurts me. Why is it? Why isn't it a natural thing? Hmm? You know, something I've learned about the family dog, you know, Foo-Foo or Fifi, the dog, is that when you turn around and accidentally step on the dog's foot, the dog lets out this wild shriek of pain, and that's normal, right? That, that's normal. Um, who caused the offense? 
Me or the dog? Not rocket science. If I step on the dog's foot, I'm the one who caused the pain, right? But what does the dog do? Right away, it comes back and says, I'm sorry, what have I done? What have I done? <laughs> the dog speaks its own language, right? Now, if it's a wild dog, then it might bite you on the ankle or something, but uh, we're talking the family pet. So it's coming to you now saying, forgive me, what have I done wrong? You know, why have you punished me? Why is it, though, that when someone offends us, we harbor a grudge? Why is it not something easy for us to be able just to, to say, oh, listen, don't mention, that's okay, it's all right. It's okay, don't worry about it. Why is it so hard for us to do that? And I've been thinking a lot about that, and, and I think the devil is involved. I think the devil somehow uses anger, frustration, uh, bitterness. Oh, here's one for you. Listen to this. We all know that anger is not such a good thing, right? And so what the devil does, he's very smart, is he doesn't call it anger. Uh, I'm not angry. I'm just upset. I'm not angry. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a bit frustrated. No, I'm not angry. I'm just browned off. I'm miffed. I'm ticked. Hmm? And there's other ways of saying the same thing, but really all it is, is anger. That's all it is. And some people actually, they enjoy holding on to some bitterness. Oh, that dirty rat. That ratigan. That man, that woman. Oh, he, she. Oh. And for some strange I don't know, crazy, devilish reason, reason maybe they love to hold on to that feeling. Maybe you've experienced that. Boy, they owe me. They better get on their knees. I won't forgive them until they grovel and eat dirt. Maybe then I won't even forgive them. And there are people like that. Maybe that describes you once upon a time. But that is a typical human kind of response as to why maybe it's so hard for us to forgive some people. Boy, they need forgiveness. But yet the Lord Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what, what they're doing. So hard to forgive people. And yet, listen to me, you and I, re we really can do it. We can do it. We can forgive people. When someone hurts you, we can forgive them. You don't have to wait 20 years for them to come before you forgive them. You can forgive them right away. Just like Jesus. He was on the cross. They nailed him there. He didn't wait for them to all line up and say, Okay, my turn, my turn, my turn. Jesus, forgive me for nailing you to the cross. Jesus, forgive me for whipping you. Jesus, forgive me for putting the crown of thorns on your face. Jesus, forgive me for uh, 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 forcing you to carry the cross. Jesus, forgive me for... And they all line up, you see. He didn't wait for that. Right away, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And also, I don't think that Jesus wanted to be hindered with those thoughts while he was doing his best work on the cross. He was paying for our sins. And he didn't want thoughts of that to, to hinder him. That's only a guess. So likewise, you and I can forgive someone. When a man or woman says something, does something, breaks a promise, screams at you, does something, you know, that, that's offensive, you can forgive them. But you can't very well do it by feeling because you don't feel like forgiving them. You feel like killing them. But you can forgive them by faith. If you're born again, you can do it. If you had faith enough to get saved, then you have faith to be able to forgive someone. The thing is, if you're struggling with bitterness and anger, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to really put it aside by faith. Do it by faith. It could be a family member. Remember I told you earlier, some of the people that can hurt us the worst are those that are closest to our hearts. And sometimes that means family members and close friends. And when they put the knife in your back, oh, you know, there's people, I'm sure if we could see this with our eyes, 
There's crowds of people all throughout our city walking around with a knife sticking in their back. Wow, there's another one. Look, this, this guy's got two knives in his back. <laughs> if we could see that kind of thing, it would kind of be a, an eye-opener. A lot of people are carrying around hurts, pains. Uh, they're bitter. They, they're carrying a grudge. And God's people can do the same thing. And so what we need is a couple of Christmas gifts. And uh, one of the best Christmas gifts you can take and use is forgiveness. There are people that need to be forgiven. And maybe there's someone in your life that you need to forgive. When you go to prayer, and if uh, this person's face were to come to mind, or their name were to come to mind, would you have a lot of uh, problems with that? If you do, here's a thought, here's a suggestion. Take a little piece of paper and write their name on that paper. And if you want, you can even write down what they did. Maybe you should do that. You could put, you know, Joe Blow, there's the name, okay. Uh, and uh, he told lies about me. And then uh, with a big pen, you write forgiven right across that and put the date on it. And then put that up on a wall in your prayer closet. You go in your prayer closet every day, every morning, you're there, and you want to be reminded, oh yeah, I forgave Joe. And I'm telling you, it won't take long at all. This wound will heal. Otherwise, it's a sore spot. It's an open wound in your life, and you don't need that. And you sure don't need that to start a brand new year and live for Jesus. So take Joe Blow, or maybe you've got to put uh, Susie Q, or whatever the name is, and what he or she did to you, and they still haven't come to you and asked for forgiveness. Well, don't wait. You forgive them tonight. And you write forgiven across that. And you put that up on the wall of your prayer closet. And I'm telling you, you have taken a weapon out of the hands of Satan. Because up until this point, Satan would use Susie Q or Joe Blow as a knife to jab in your heart. And every time you think of him or her, you just think of the pain they've caused you. And so you need to disarm the devil and so you write forgiven and put that up in your prayer closet and every time you see them yep, I've forgiven them and now you can start to pray that God bless them if they're not saved pray that they would get saved pray that God would protect them pray that God might heal them if they're sick or give them a job if they're unemployed you know it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance did you know that's what the Bible says the goodness of God uh, leads to repentance. So ask God to bless them. So this is a very, very important gift. You, you and I really can do it, but we do it by faith, not by feeling. Okay, quickly, number two, the second gift. The first gift is forgiveness. And the second gift is forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. You know, a good forgetter can come in handy sometimes. Having a good forgetter. Something that I'm finding now as I'm starting to um, um, add a few years under my belt is I'm forgetting some things. And you know I'm happy. There are some things in life that I've experienced that I just never want to remember again. And as long as I remember them, they're dark clouds in my life. They're downers. But to be able to forget these things is good. So having a, a healthy forgetter is uh, actually something that might be good. So praise the Lord, you don't have a photographic memory. Sometimes we wish we had. Oh, I wish I could read the scriptures and just have it memorized. And I could spout out all these Bible verses. I could just remember everything. But you'd also be remembering all of the dirty, you know, rotten things that people have done to you and that maybe you've done to others, you would never be able to forget them. So praise the Lord if you've got a, a good forgetter. That's something, maybe that's the grace of God in our lives. There's a, um, a humorous story about, about a guy who was a bit for, forgetful. Sometimes it happens at the wrong time. Have you noticed that? You meet somebody new. How about, how about this, okay? 
you meet someone for the very first time and you tell them their name, they tell you your name. What happens in five seconds? Isn't it amazing? We forgot their name. And it was just five seconds ago. And then they're talking and our brains are working overtime trying to remember what the name was. That, those are times when your forgetter maybe is a little too active. <laughs> but there's a humorous story about a couple that was going to go on a nice trip, a nice vacation. And so um, they got to the um, airport and they're standing in line waiting to check their bags. And uh, they got a lot of bags. And the guy turns to his wife and says, you know, sweetheart, I wish we had brought the piano with us. And she said, the piano? She said, honey, we got 16 bags here. What do we want the piano for? Uh, because the uh, airline tickets are on top of the piano. <laughs> so if you don't understand what that means, come and see me after. Well, when it comes to forgiving, that's one thing. But when it comes to forgetting, ah, that's why you sometimes hear people say, well, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget what you've done. Sometimes you run into that. Well, that's almost, you know, one cancels out the other. If you can't forget, and you're always thinking about it, you know, you really haven't forgiven. These are two gifts, Christmas gifts, that, that go together. You need them both. Wouldn't it be something if there were a, maybe a button somewhere on your body or on your brain, you know, and every kind of bad experience, you push a button for forgiveness, ah, oh, I've forgiven them. Now I'll push this button and I'll forget all about it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Did you know that God, when he forgives, he forgets? That is absolutely true. You go to God asking for forgiveness and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He will forgive us. Well, what about the forgetting? Yes, God forgets. You come to him the end of the day or the next day and say, Oh, Father, I'm sorry, I just committed this sin again. And if you could hear God the Father speak, he would say, My child, you're mistaken. No, 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 God. Uh, this is the second time I've come to you with this, this sin, this needing you for, to forgive me. And God says, No, I'm serious. This is the first time you've come to me today. It's because when God forgives, he also forgets. There's a story about these two guys talking and one of them's bemoaning. He's having trouble in his marriage. He says, oh, he says, me, me and my wife, he says, whenever anything goes wrong, whenever I, I do something, she, she gets historical on me. And his friend said, ha ha, that's funny. You mean hysterical, don't you? He says, no, I mean historical. She remembers every mistake I've ever made. <laughs> and some people, they just can't forget. Forgetting is a blessing. It's a blessing because as long as you remember what dirty, rotten thing someone did to you, you're never going to get joy and peace. Never. Well, how, how, how can I forget? It's hard enough to forgive. How do I forget? And these things are two gifts that go together. True forgiveness and true forgetfulness. Now, here is something that will help you. The word forget literally just means to loosen your grip. That's what it means to loosen your grip. There's a guy in the Old Testament and he was one of David's uh, mighty men. He took a sword and he went in against the bad guys and he fought them all day so that the, the sword and his hand almost became one. He couldn't let go of the sword. Now, I'm massacring the scripture there, but that's the idea. The guy fought so much that the sword, it, it stuck, it, it clave to his hand. He couldn't, he couldn't open his fingers. He couldn't let go. Now, in that case, it was a victory, but think about it. If you can't open your hand, right? Imagine if you had a dollar in your hand and there was someone who, who was needy, needed food or something, 
and you had that dollar in your hand. And they said to you, would you give them the dollar? Would you give them the dollar? And there you are with that, that dollar in your fist. And I'd like to, but I can't get my, my hand open. I just can't let it go. You'd say, that's pretty sick. You know, you can't let go of a dollar to help another human being. That's kind of kind of on the sick side, I think. But yet some people hold on to the memories of the injustices done to them. Like that guy in the Old Testament whose sword clung to his hand. He just, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't get it open. The word forget just means to loosen. It doesn't mean to throw away completely. It means to loosen. I'll give you an example. Do you remember um, Jacob and Esau? Do you remember those two brothers, Jacob and Esau? Yes? Nod at me if you remember them. Okay, good. Um, Remember how Jacob stole away the blessing? I guess the birthright, but more particularly the blessing. He, he went in there and got his father to give him the blessing. He dressed up like his brother. Do you remember that story? That's real wild stuff. You know, only two brothers could, you know, <laughs> hate each other so much and do that kind of thing. So anyhow, Jacob ends up with the blessing. And so Esau says, that's it, he's dead. I'm killing him. And Esau was a hunter. He was used to killing. He said, I'm going to kill my brother. I'm going to pull a cane here and I'm going to kill my brother. And so Rebecca, the mother, says, listen, go, go and, and live with my brother, your uncle Laban, until, you're, until Esau for, forgets. And so if you do the math, you'll find out that Jacob was gone for 20 years. And that's when he finally decides to come back to the promised land. Well, as he's coming back, who comes out to meet him? Who? Esau. And he's not alone. He's got 400 warriors with him. Jacob rightly thought, this is it. It's the end of the line. My goose is cooked. After 20 years, they both remembered what was done 20 years ago. But after spending a whole night in prayer, Jacob got a victory, got a blessing, and God turned the heart of his brother so that when they met, there was forgiveness. They still remembered, but they forgave. The grip was loosed. And that's all you got to do. When you forgive someone, that's one thing. When you forget, just loosen your grip. That's all you do. I'll tell you, one of the greatest ways to be able to turn that burden into a blessing, to be able to turn, I guess, that curse you know, into a, into a gift from God is to start looking for how God will bless you. Now, if someone has done something really bad to you, you forgive them, but you're still hurting inside. You still got the pain inside. By faith, you're forgiving them. When you do that, God will start to bless you. I've had things done to me in life. I've had the knife not just put in my back, but run right through my stomach. <laughs> I've had things done to me in life that are just, ah, people have killed for less than what I've had done to me. But a secret I've learned, and I, I'm not sure if I learned it from my kids or if I learned it from the Lord and applied it to my kids. But I remember when my kids were very small, we were in a church in Ottawa, and there was a little boy that was a bit of a bully on my kids. And sometimes he would physically, you know, hurt them. Well, what does that make you feel like as a parent, right? You want to kill that kid. And so somehow in there, God gave us some wisdom that whenever they got, you know, abused by this boy, because he was like a bull in a china shop. Whenever my kids got abused... I'd take them to Dairy Queen and treat them with, for, with ice cream. Wow. Well, now that turned the bully now into a blessing. And they started looking for ways to antagonize him. No, I don't think they did. But I have seen in my own life God do this numerous times that whenever someone has done something really filthy to me, really dirty... If I, by faith, give it back to, to God and forgive them, I'll see God bless me. And I've had some incredible blessings happen to me. 
And when you receive those blessings, you start thinking, hey, I wouldn't be blessed if it wasn't for that guy, if it wasn't for that gal. I wouldn't have these things if it wasn't for what they did because look how God's blessed me. He's taken me to a heavenly dairy queen or, or a spiritual da dairy queen and he's blessed me. I am, I am excited by what I have now. And listen, the, the people that have done me the real dirt, I've been able to now not just forgive them. Listen to this. I've been able to thank God for them. They didn't realize it. You see, this is what Joseph found in the Old Testament when his brothers, you know, sold him into slavery. Remember that? And then Joseph ended up being the prime minister of Egypt. And when Jacob, the father, was dead, the brothers came to him and he said, now you guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Look how God has blessed me. And when you start seeing that, all of a sudden, it's not only easy to forgive and forget, but I mean, it's a happy, joyful thing. And when you see that person, you'll thank God for them. Now, that's something only God can do. Doesn't that sound like a good Christmas gift? Let's not celebrate the Savior's birth with thoughts of revenge and thoughts of bitterness. If someone has done you her harm and hurt and damage tonight forgive them from your heart forgive them and start looking for what God will do start to just loosen your grip on those memories if need be take a paper put their name on there write what they did wrong to you write forgiven date it pin it to the wall of your prayer closet so it's a constant reminder the devil has no hold on you, no weapon that will prosper against you. Two very, very important gifts for Christmas. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.